All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Friday at 1 p.m. or 1.02 p.m. Uh, General Housing and Military Affairs. We are here this afternoon to uh, introduce or to, just to have bill introductions on four bills that have um, a relationship to the issues related to the Abenaki. Uh, this has been these these bills have been um, ongoing in our committee. That's because it is part of our portfolio. These are just some of the bills that will be um, that are out in the world on Abenaki issues. There's some in Ways and Means, and there's some in Fish and Wildlife. But um, we are dealing with four bills here today. Um, we're going to start the day with. Um, Representative O'Brien, who is here on, I'm going to lose my page. 520. <clears throat> Representative O'Brien is here on H H618. So Representative O'Brien, I believe this is the first time you've ever testified to our committee. And so Welcome. Um, we are going to introduce ourselves to you, starting with the folks who are on Zoom. Hello and welcome, Representative O'Brien. I'm Mary Howard. I represent Rutland District 53. Representative oh, oh, I think that I'm next to the alphabet. Hello, uh, <laughs> Representative O'Brien. Welcome. Nice to see you. John Kalaki from South Burlington. Hi, Representative O'Brien. John Pulasic representing Milton. Representative O'Brien, Chip Troiano from Standard. We know each other. <laughs> and uh, uh, O'Brien and I know each other too. Tommy Waltz from Berry City. And been here now, uh, Representative Matt Byron, Virgins. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Representative Lisa Hango, and I represent Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richford on the northern border. Nice to meet you. Hello, Tiff Bloomley, I'm representing Burlington South End. I'm Joe Parsons. I represent Newberry, Topsom, and Grob. Barbara Murphy, representing Fairfax. And Representative Tom Stevens uh, from Waterbury, representing Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buell's Gore. So welcome. Well, thank you. Um, I think I, I know all of you, at least from Zoom tiles, uh, if not in person. Um, and <clears throat> Representative Hango uh, was just over in House Ag introducing a bill. So. Uh, <laughs> She's turned the tables on me here. Uh, uh, also, I, I, also I, I, I think this is only the second bill I've um, been the lead sponsor on. And so uh, last time it was, uh, I was in house transportation and uh, appropriately like a deer in the headlights. Uh, <laughs> it's a little scary when you're a freshman and you go before one of these committees and, and have to introduce a bill. So if, if I do probably a dozen, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point where they'll be, uh, I'll be relaxed anyway. Yeah. So uh, a narrative on, on where this bill came from. In, in House Ag, we, as you probably do here, we often have these sort of, um, clearing house uh, cattle call uh, uh, hearings where I think in you know, a rural Vermont or NOFA invites a whole lot of farmers and people in the food systems economy to come in and talk to our, uh, our committee. And uh, Chief Don Stevens of the Nolpegan Abenaki tribe um, kept popping up in these things. There was a Red Wing um, hearing too that he was in and he, and he, he described the challenges his tribe was having raising food. Um, they own a, a bison herd, but they they have to um, use somebody else's land. They they don't own any land, and so their their food sovereignty or their their um, it's just really hard for that tribe to to raise their own food, whether it's livestock or crops. 
Uh, so I thought, and, and in one other time he said, hey, don't forget us. So those two things in mind, I, I said about thinking like, just because I'm a, I'm a, a, a farmer and a, and a food person um, and from that committee, I thought, is there anything we can do here to, to increase access for the tribes to, um, to raise their own food? Uh, talking about food, you know, it, I'm, a, as I mentioned, I'm a farmer. I'm also, uh, I, I love all things about food, um, maybe not as much as Representative Byron, but, uh, you know, I like food shopping. I, uh, I love eating. Uh, I love cooking. I don't like dishes, but that's probably the only thing. And I, I like almost then all food. you and I are totally on par with one another. <laughs> And I don't like liver, um, but otherwise. Uh, <laughs> so interesting, you know, just from a personal standpoint, I really understand on my farm that I grew up on in Tunbridge that, you know, if, if that farm was, if I was dispossessed of it or the farm was stolen, you know, how frustrating that would be, you know, if I wanted to, you know, raise my sheep or plant apple trees and I was no longer able to do that. And then I, Going back to House Ag, um, you know, almost every day now in House Ag, we talk about regenerative farming and healthy soils, how important they are to Vermont, and how actually great the soils are in Vermont. We're sort of way ahead of the country on, on where we are with soils and soil science. And then now, this week especially, uh, old forest has come up a lot. These, these forests that are managed to just sort of be themselves. And it takes like 120 years for an old forest to be a, an old forest. So, uh, but Vermont only has about 1% of old forest left. So, you know, historically you look at this, it's like, well, the, the Abenaki tribes were, were doing regenerative farming 10,000 years ago and they understood healthy soils and they understood clean water. We you know, think of Atlantic salmon, you know, in Royalton and Tunbridge is pretty amazing. Uh, and they also, because they were so non-invasive, understood old forest. So I think we have a lot to learn from um, Abenaki tribes and their relation to the relationship to the land, both in, in terms of, of agriculture, husbandry, uh, and also that, that sort of harvesting of, of food, whether it's um, in hunting, fishing, trapping, or foraging in the woods. So this bill, H618, uh, an act, what do they call it? An act relating to providing the Abenaki with access to state lands uh, for the purposes of, um, of farming, of hunting, fishing, trapping, um, and also for sacred, religious, and cultural uh, practices uh, is, you know, it's a short bill, but it, as, as we always say, it's not, um, it's not simple and it's not easy. The outcomes of this bill, what it does is it's proposing that, that the Abenaki tribes uh, would have access um, to state-owned land or state lease land in some cases um, to to do all these things that they did 10,000 years ago. You know, whether it's, it's raise crops, um, raise animals, um, hunt, trap, fish, forage, and, and also those religious and, and cultural practices. And hopefully move towards food sovereignty too. I know the Vermont Commission on Native <coughs> Uh, American affairs and what you've been dealing with this, the truth and accountability process wants to move towards the tribes um, owning their own land. So their food sovereignty would be, uh, you know, much, much, much more secure. Their food security um, would be insured if they own their own land and <clears throat> how long this process is going to take. We, we don't know. And so this, I see this bill as, you know, as something incremental moving towards that. It's not, as, as I think Carol McGannigan said from the 
VCNAA, that she was cautious that she didn't want to, um, if this bill made it to the finish line, that we'd, that we'd all say, well, that's, that's close enough to the truth and accountability process. Let's, we're, we're done now. I, I don't see it that way at all. And, uh, and I, I suspect this committee wouldn't either, given, given that you know a lot more about Abenaki, um, that, that whole process of, of this truth and accountability than, than I certainly do. So I see this as, uh, you know, if you take Forest Parks and Rec or you take uh, BGS or you take the Department of Corrections, you know, there's so much land in Vermont, like just the state forest, I think, or it's like 350,000 acres. It seems like there's enough land out there to make this work. And I also think, you know, there need to be rules and, and, and vetting involved and, and this agencies and departments and the tribes and the VC and AA, um, you know, working this out with with a spirit of collaboration. But you know, if you go from the tribes not being really federal, not being federally recognized, and Vermont um, not being the state of Vermont, sort of following along, that with, with that finding to go from no land to potentially. Um, a lot of land uh, or enough land to raise plenty of food. It, it seems like it would be a very healthy um, bill to become law. And I can see, you know, think of something like the Windsor prison where there's so many painful memories there, you know, but it's a hundred acres, it's a hundred acre farm to turn that into a garden would be a really spectacular thing. Or, you know, rich floodplain in the Nalhagen basin and the same thing you could grow a lot of crops there uh many pitfalls <laughs> with this bill uh starting with me i mean I, I understand there's there's so much complexity around anything with the tribes that uh, that i'm sure to put my foot in my mouth at some point and and um or tick somebody off somewhere or some community off but uh so i'm out of my comfort zone with this bill and i but I, I feel it's important to, to, to pitch it to you. And, and I really trust this committee to do a good job vetting it. For example, talking with Damian Leonard at Legislative Council who draws up these bills for, for your committee, uh, we decided to remain silent on potential, you know, there are all these contingencies that always come up. And so we, we decided to remain silent on, on say, commercial uses of, of state land. So say a tribe had, you know, a 10,000 tap sugar bush, um, you know, is that, would that be too much on, on state land or, or if they made too much money, you know, would there be a cap on it? So, or could they have a farm stand on state land if they grew a lot of pumpkins? Uh, but those are the sort of things I think this committee would, would, would vet very well or and figure out you know maybe in consultation and engagement with with the departments and the agencies you know how does this work you know there, there has to be a way for to figure this out so that it's not abused but at the same time there are opportunities there for the tribes so, so good luck with that um and along those lines on the precedence of it i found out um, talking to Commissioner Snyder from FPR that already there, there are a bunch of usage and access um, rules for tribes, like we're all Vermonters for say, for example, say foraging in our state forest, you can do that now. Um, and I know, I think this, this committee, you, you were the ones who were probably vetting, uh, was it last year's bills on on hunting licenses, forever hunting licenses, or hunting licenses for tribes, um, and also the having was it state state parks use Abenaki names also. So you have some experience with this, but I, I also think a lot of the agencies that that would be involved here also have experience um, with tribal matters. So, uh, in summation, which is. The sweetest word in the English language, 
since we all sit in meetings, we're almost there. Uh, um, you know, this is a, I, I found bipartisan support for this. And it was funny because um, Representative Donahue said that this is, this is great. It's, it opens an important dialogue and Representative Webb said, all right, I'll sign on, but this may open a can of worms. And I think it's, you know, both of those are really true. Uh, and then talking to Commissioner Snyder, he said, yeah, it's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be simple, uh, but, but we're happy to engage. And I think if this committee's like that, if the stakeholders engage, um, who knows where this could go, but I, I, I have a good feeling about it. So thank you very much. And any questions? See Tommy. Representative Walsh, then Hango. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, John, for presenting that. Uh, I grew up in Maine uh, where there was a similar issue. The tribes there were recognized by the state, but not by the federal government. And when they finally did get federal recognition, uh, the state ceded them, and I forget the exact amount, but it was many hundreds of acres of land. And I'm just wondering if that would be a solution here when it comes to questions of what's appropriate use, you know, should it, should they be commercial, uh, commercial activity on the land, uh, which the main Indians have done. They've done logging, for example. Um, I wonder if, if a way to get around this is just to cede the land to them and, uh, and it's theirs to do with as they wish. You know, it's not in this bill, um, but I think that's going to be a discussion going forward, you know, in, in future bienniums, because uh, I, I know the tribes would like to have, you know, ownership of, of land um, in Vermont that, that, right, they can, they can do with what they see fit. But I, you know, and I don't know. I think even in Maine, right? That was it was controversial as far as it wasn't necessarily the same land where these tribes uh, traditionally were from. <clears throat> For example, yeah. So, yeah. Well, typical in our dealing with Native Americans, right? Uh, <laughs> basically, it was paper company land. The paper companies weren't using anymore, and nobody wanted it, so that's what they gave them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would hope. That, yeah, I would hope in Vermont, you know, if, if if and when we could get to that point, it won't be like, well, we'll, we'll give the Nulhegan tribe, the old Belvedere Eden, the asbestos mine. <laughs> it won't be like that. It'd be like, we'll, we'll give them, you know, uh, traditional lands. Well, and I think to, your, to that point, uh, Representative, it's, that's exactly what the issue would be. I mean, it's like, do you give people gristle? Or you give them something that's that's worthwhile, and 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 I think that there's a stereotypical um, default to the gristle because um, that's easier to give away. Um, but that's not what I don't think that's the work that we're looking at <laughs> right now. Um, Representative Hango, then Kalaki. Thank you, Representative O'Brien, for bringing this forward. Um, I do have Abnaki in my district, and this is a really interesting bill, so I appreciate it. I also appreciate your comments about um, doing your first bill introductions. I felt very similar in your committee the other day, so thanks for that. That gave me a good laugh. Representative Kalaki, then Byron. Uh, thank you, Representative O'Brien. I believe uh, the Vermont Land Trust has now entered into agreements with the tribes to allow access for some of these things you're talking about in your bill to their land. Is that, I mean, if you go forward with this bill, is it a parallel process? Do you know? I don't know, Representative Kalaki. I'm not, you know, I've heard that there's a, another bill that's probably, it's coming before you, it has already come about, um, making Abenaki lands uh, tax exempt. I mean, and they don't really even own their own land, but they have arrangements with not-for-profits being, being, you know, the, the intermediary 
so that it's that's as close as they can get. And I think yeah. some of those lands are Vermont land trust land. So I, I suspect that relationship is somewhat ahead of where this bill would go, but but similar sort of arrangements. Okay. And then I just, w one word, I just want to make sure I understood the intention of it uh, in your bill. Um, it says vested interest. And I, so if people are growing here, nothing in this section on page three shall be constructed to require taking a vested property interest. But if I was allowed to grow crops on a land, um, which sounds fantastic, wouldn't I want to have some kind of vested interest in that plot so that uh, Representative Toronto wouldn't come over in his motorcycle and take all my crops away, you know, or, or, or I, I don't know what vested means. And so, did, and I know this is an introduction, but what did you mean by that? Uh, as far as I know, I mean, it, I think we should probably defer to, to legal counsel on sure. that, okay, right? Because sure. I think it may be, I know in, in, in real estate law, it probably has a different meaning somewhat okay. than you know, what I would uh, guess it to be. So it may just be the, that um, they don't own, own the ground on which they're growing crops or, or have some sort of um, uh, right to it. And, okay. and, and almost, almost like a, you know, a dairy farmer leasing a hay field. I know that it's probably something similar to that. Well, thank you very much. And it may very well be about the, a real estate illusion might be like a condemnation, a state sponsored condemnation of a property or taking you know, the taking of a property um, where the state or the municipality or whoever determines, yes, we need that. We'll give it to you for, we'll, we'll buy what we determine what the market. I mean, all that's, you know, the, the messy, messy real estate deals. I think it's just what that's trying to avoid right, right there. Um, Representative Byron. Thank you. Um, lease was the perfect segue. Um, you're talking about leased land that the state owns. I was just trying to like spin through my mind of examples I know, know of that. Um, so you have an entity like Stowe Mountain leases that portion of like Mount Mansfield from the state, but they own the gear and blah, blah, blah. So what are, what are other examples of lease land? Because that's really the only type that I know of right now that this would be is that like is that like logging? Like I'm not even sure. Yeah, I, and, and that's certainly above my pay grade too. Um, okay. well, sure it, it, it came up, I think, you know, when Damien was was crafting this, um, and that's the sort of thing, right? Where whoever has whatever agency say has jurisdiction over that, you know, they I, I can see them saying like this is this is too complicated. Let's drop this or let you know let us um, work work this out with the tribes. Um, Depending on right how long the lease is and and what sort of protections the tribes would have if they if they started to do some of the stuff that this bill allows them to do on that land, um, and there are okay. all those questions of like could the tribe right could a tribe grow tobacco on on the face at you know at at Stowe or on the state house lawn? I mean there, those are the sort of things that maybe but you know I think it would there'd be a vetting process that that hopefully everybody could agree on. But, you know, and, and, and you guys are, you do housing. So it was interesting yesterday and in, in actually on Representative Hango's um, bill that it, it has to do with the Highgate Airport and next to it is the Franklin County Field Days land, which is actually state owned. It's on the state um, state owned airport land and, and it, it apparently looked like uh, a developer wants to come in and put in an industrial park there, but the state might actually sell a certain amount of acres to that developer. And that I never actually heard that the state, you know, is sort of a, a realtor and they potentially might sell acres. I know they're we're always doing land swaps and things like that, but I, I was um, it was the first I'd ever heard that the state actually could sell land. And you might know more about that as a committee. 
I, that's through the that's through the capital um, that's that's through institutions committee. They have to go through a process of when they want to shed land or lease land or, and then when you're dealing with airports, it's a whole different story as well because there has to be you know there has to be setbacks and stuff and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I mean the land that the state this it, it fluctuates. You know, I don't know that they ever call it surplus land, but it just it fluctuates. So um Representative Murphy then Trout. I was just gonna share, I don't know if it would be too informal, but when you were speaking of any of these circumstances of leasing land, I have friends who have a certain amount of acreage that they don't care to maintain, but a, a local farmer pays it for them. And so they do the fields and stuff and he and there's no fee. He he gets a crop and they get their meadows maintained. So you know, I think there are mutually agreeable situations that get worked out and could be used as examples. Yeah, that's a good point. And I know that, you know, just growing up in Tunbridge that that we've gone from with that very example, we've gone from the farmers, you know, back in the 1970s and 80s actually paying, say, a neighbor who has a, a field exactly. for the hay, for standing hay. And then it then it's gotten to, you know, where it was, please just tame hey, my feel, you do, you can have the hay. <laughs> and now it's getting to the point where those those neighbors are paying the farmers to actually cut the field. So they get paid for it and they get a crop. Is that a trial? Yeah, I have the same arrangement with my neighbor who hays our, uh, my fields and uh, he feeds it to his brief cattle and, you know, that it's just, he takes it for what it, for, just takes it and uh, no charge. And uh, he does maintain the fields with some manure and, uh, and um, it, as you say, maintains it and keeps them open. You know, it's really valuable to me to have open land. But I guess my question, John, is if you know, um, with this, we, are you considering this to be exclusive rights? For instance, um, you know, we've got 2,300 acres here on Center Mountain that bought, as part of the Steamobrook Wildlife Preserve. Um, it's a very popular hunting fishing area. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, um, I, I think there's a great idea and certainly Native people would be welcome um, if they could find it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy access. But, um, you know, uh, would, this, uh, would this be an exclusive right? Uh, would you anticipate or would it be open to the uh, general public? Do you have, have you given that thought? Yeah, I mean, what, what you know, you, you and your motorcycle versus versus a patch of pumpkins. I mean, I, I think there would have to be some protections um, if there was farming going on or, uh, you know, hunting or fishing, you know, when might the season might be different, which I think it already is for some of the tribes um, with uh, fish and wildlife. Um, so, so as long as there were protections, I, you know, I, I think they're also great educational opportunities um, for for Vermonters here too that if you know here's here's a hundred acres of, of say traditional Abenaki um, husbandry you know what does that look like what could we learn from that we could take school trips there I, I, I see a lot of that potentially too yeah that's that sounds great this is a, a, a nice piece of work John thank you All right, further questions for Representative O'Brien. Chair right. Stevens? Yes. Uh, is there any way, um, I, I know once it's happened on your, on your committee webpage, you know, I could find out who, who was called to testify on the bill. Is there, is there, um, sort of, I guess, looking at the agenda every week, is, is, is there a notice that, oh, we're gonna look at, you know, this bill this week? And does anything like that happen? Well, we, we schedule about a week out in advance. Okay. You know, I, I, work with, I work with the vice chair and, and, and our committee assistant. We set an agenda for the following week and we usually release that agenda you know, as early as Friday afternoons, um, as late as Monday afternoons. So there is some advance warning. We would call witnesses. Um, 
I mean, uh, you mentioned Mike Snyder. He would certainly be at the top of the list to talk about. Not and, and, and I have two bills that I'll talk about when you're done here that don't fit hand in glove with this, but that are related to um, land and um, Abenaki use of land. But I think you brought up a very important point is that some of these organizations, whether it's the land trust, whether it's the state, already have certain agreements with the Abenaki about certain um, access points that they can utilize. Um, and the question is, you know, there's a question as to, you know, well, do we just fence off 300 acres for bison? Or do we, you know, however that works, is it land and trust? Is it ownership rights? You know, I mean, there's all these questions that, there's all these different mechanisms that can be used. It's just a question of what does the state what does the state do? And the fact that, I mean, our, our, my experience with Commissioner Snyder has always been positive. He's always been very um, engaged in these conversations. Um, he's not one to, and, and you expressed it in a different way than I'm gonna say, but he's never one to just say no and make it that hard. He's always interested in hearing what the, what the question is and to see if it's a problem that can be solved, knowing full well that the system is, arrayed against the simplest ideas um but he's always engaged in trying to find a solution that that would honor uh the request so um he's definitely high level. so so that's a long way to say um yeah we 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 post our we post our agenda pretty much a week before okay so that, that's super helpful right if i just go monday and look at your agenda then i could just in case they're, they're stakeholders who are interested in, in watching, as I am. Um, yes, it's certainly, I mean, I think we all, we, you know, if there are specific stakeholders that you would like us to hear, please forward those on to me or to, to Ron Wild and, and we'll, you know, keep a folder of, of possibilities. I mean, I, I know, of course, you know, we'll talk to Chief Stevens, we'll talk to the commission, we'll talk to uh, Commissioner Snyder, there may be others. Um, again, you'll hear, you know, there's plenty of folks on this bill, on these next two bills that, um, that are connected, but, um, you know, we want to see what's possible. Yep, that's great. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Trano, is that a new hand or? No, okay. All right. He has a, thank he has a legacy of legacy hands. Yeah, it really will be his legacy. <laughs> uh, no, it, it won't, Chip. He didn't mean it that way. Uh, I missed what he said. What did you say, Byron? <laughs> yeah, the legacy hand will be your biggest legacy. <laughs> in the COVID world. I would hope that it'd be a little bit better. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get the COVID world thing. That was the caveat. You've done so much more pre COVID. I understand, but blue hand is a blue hand, you know. <laughs> oh, <not> so, <laughs> Rep Representative O'Brien, I understand that the Agriculture Committee wasn't meeting today, so you're free to stay um, if you'd like to hear these other bills, um, these other Abenaki related bills. Um, if not, then thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thanks, you too. All right. I'm gonna, I guess, motor out to the bottom of the. Are we not doing a 520? Is Jim Meslin? Uh, he's not here yet. Oh, okay. That's that he, uh, he didn't I respond, really and nor did his committee assistant. So. Okay. But we, uh, but he did respond to the invitation some days ago. I saw Canfield hitting hitting the streets on her way up here. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, Representative Maslin works at home, so. Um, <laughs> But I was saying it looked like the committee had broken for the day. Yeah. That was my point. All right. Um, I am going to uh, start with S620, which is a short form. It's a bill I put in. Um, what's that? Speech. What did I say? Yes. My ambition. Dude, if we get to S620s, man. Yeah. H620. Um, over the course of the fall, uh, we've been in conversation, as always, with uh, different folks from the either the uh, Vermont 
uh, Commission on Native American Affairs through mostly through the chair Carol McGranahan um, uh, or some of the other or some of the other um, chiefs, and they brought forward a list of priorities as people do, and this was one of them. This is um, a short form that so it goes into or it's connected in some way to what Representative O'Brien was just introducing in the sense that it's about land and the use of the land and I'm just reading the statement of the purpose of the bill is that it pro proposes to clarify the right of recognized Abenaki tribes and bands to own land in Vermont and to create a study committee to examine possible mechanisms to allow for the repatriation of traditional Abenaki lands to the tribes through mechanisms such as a transfer of title, the establishment of permanent easements and other novel legal mechanisms that would ensure the perpetual preservation and protection of land and access to it for use by the Abenaki. So it's really just a, an idea is to, um, the first part to clarify the right of recognized tribes, our statute, when we, when we pass the recognition statutes, we expressly put in that recognition does not mean that land would be granted to them and that there are no rights of, you know, whether it's casinos or, or, or other businesses like that, that, um, that can fall to federally recognized tribes. So the idea of clarifying the right uh, to own land in Vermont is um, they can own lands that's purchased of their own accord. They can own, um, they may be organized as nonprofit organizations. They may be, um, so the, the question of, of how that would work or to clarify it, I think, I think one of the issues again brought up by Representative O'Brien is that getting an idea of how the state interacts with the Abenakis already would be one thing. But the key thing here is, is a committee to, um, examine the possible mechanisms to allow for repatriation of traditional lands, which is um, ownership primarily. Um, and in other states, there might be, a, rather than this being granted to a particular tribe or band, it may be held in trust. In, in, in other states, they hold them in trust so that, that the, um, that the, Indigenous people feel like they can come and go as they please on land that they have control over, which is an important right. That's a step above what is proposed in the um, in the previous bill. The second bill that um, has has a small number of well, it has twenty plus sponsors to it is H six sixty eight. And this is about protection of Abenaki sacred sites and providing a tax exemption for those sites if they own it. Um, or it could be for um, people who have these sites on their properties. And this is obviously important to them in historical, in a historical um, light of, um, uh, the clearest example I have is the petroglyphs in the, on the Connecticut River that um, in other states recently there has been damage done has been there's been um, graffiti or over scratching uh, done on you know some sacred some sacred sites in different parts of the country. And so the key on this one, um, so the first key is that it would develop a list and identify to the state sites and locations in Vermont that have cultural, religious, or spiritual significance to Native American Indians or are used by Native American Indians for cultural, religious, or spiritual purposes or both. Um, that the, um, state would be able to consult there's a definition here of consult, which is new to me. I don't know if it's new in state language. It was in Representative O'Brien's bill as well. 
Um, it, this commission, this study would, would also make recommendations to the state regarding the acquisition and facilitation of access to these cultural and sacred sites that are located on private lands and currently inaccessible to Native American Indians. It would make recommendations to the General Assembly regarding legis possible legislative actions to encourage private property owners to preserve and protect these sites and to allow access. And then um, it does do a change to the, um, the way the commission meets, about how many times the commission can meet and um, commissioners would be receiving the per diem. It would, it would um, say that the commission shall meet as needed uh, no more than nine times a year which according to the commission is still short of what they usually do, but this would allow them to get paid for nine at the, at the per diem rate, which is fairly low, um, for nine meetings rather than the six. Um, and then these records of sacred sites, like the applications that were made for recognition, would be considered to be confidential and shall not be subject to copying or inspection. And that's, that's something that's very important, that was very important during the recognition process, um, given that people, have, that, that, that the Native Americans have felt attacked by others who, who dispute their, their um, <laughs> status. And then this idea of consulting, you know, that the, there's a statement of intent here about the protection of cultural and sacred sites, saying that it's the policy of the state of Vermont to protect and preserve the inherent right of the members of the Vermont Native American Indian peoples to believe, express, and exercise their traditional beliefs and cultural and religious practices, including through access to Native American cultural and sacred sites, the use and possession of culturally significant or sacred objects and materials, including tobacco and the freedom to practice, to practice traditional ceremonies and rites. And then it gives um, a list of things that the state um, will allow, which is permitting access um, for ceremonial purposes. These sites, these cultural sites that are owned on property, owned or leased by the state. And um, the consultation with the commission shall be conducted in a way that's mutually respectful and shall recognize the potential need for confidentiality with respect to the particular Native American cultural and sacred site. And then there's a repetition of what we just saw in, in, in um, Representative O'Brien's bill about the vested in property interests. And, um, and again, the last on page, the bottom of page five is, the, is that definition of consult. Um, which it means to engage in a meaningful and timely process of seeking, discussing, and considering carefully the views of others in a manner that is cognizant of all parties' cultural values and where feasible seeking agreement. The last section, section three, or the last substantive section, section three, is, is uh, um, that real property identified as Native American cultural or sacred site um, pursuant to this shall be um, tax exempt. So, um, that is this bill. And the two of them together are, they, um, there is a bill in Ways and Means that Representative Sims, I believe, was the lead sponsor on. That was, I'm on that as well. Yeah. The one about tax exemption, tax exemption yes. bill, um, which is different than this. It's because yes. it's, about, it's about tribe property. That's like existing for the purpose of the, yeah. Right, and that one they'll you know if they take that bill up, it takes I think the I think the financial commitment to that is less than fifteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah, it's like eleven thousand. Yes. So, but that's in you know that's in their committee. Um, so these bills, you know, these are these are part of um, these are part of a list of priorities from from the tribes and from the commission. They are um, there are others, I believe. Uh, the and we'll consider as we as we see fit as we can you know it's it's a long 
ongoing process of, of trying to you know, make a certain peace with the Abenaki um, in ways that we can, that are meaningful. And, you know, I think we've heard that farming is, is, is important. Um, certainly in the past, hunting is important. Identification of place names is important. And those are smaller, really low cost items. Um, repatriation is a harder conversation to have because that's a deeper ownership issue and how we deal with state property and, and, and then moving ownership to any of that. Uh, but those are the conversations that we have in this committee when we have this, when we have this, this subject in front of us. So that's what I have on these two bills. I can't see if anybody's asking questions. I was just scanning. Okay. John had his hand up and wanted to go, but it's not. I, I, I took it down because I, I, for me, the complexity in this bill is the issue of uh, public as access with nonprofit status. So if it's on private land, if it's granted nonprofit status, I think that's it has to have public access to it. So, I, and I think it's in this bill. I mean, I, I'm part of this, I'm supportive of this bill, but I think that that's the twist for me that we have to really, really figure out what that means, what, what it really can look like, so. Right, and there are so many potential answers to it that um, we would just have to sort out, you know, what, you know, what, what would work? Right. All right. Um, let's take 10 minutes and come back at two and deal with 477. I think Dan